uh, is called Turning Towards Emptiness. And uh, these talks are all from the book The Way It Is, uh, which is uh, Teachings from the Winter Retreat of 1988. Turning Towards Emptiness. By reflecting, you bring into consciousness the state of conditions as they happen to be now. Having been born, we're now this age, feeling this way, at this time, and in this place. That's the way it is. That cannot be changed by us. It's just the inevitability of birth that this is the way it is now. And when you realize this, you have a perspective on the way it is rather than a reaction to the way it is. If you don't reflect, you just react to the way it is. If you're feeling happy, you get high. I want to be a monk for the rest of my life and devote myself to the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the way for me, the only way, the true way. And you go out and bore people with a harangue on the importance of Buddhism in the world because you're high and you feel positive and confident. Even that feeling of being inspired and confident and full of faith and devotion and all those kinds of things, that's the way it is. One can feel a lot of faith, confidence in what one's doing, or one can feel the opposite. One loses faith, one feels that this is a waste of time. I've wasted my life, it's of no value, I haven't got anywhere, it hasn't done anything for me, I don't believe in it anymore, I'm fed up with it. Or one can feel indifference. Yeah, it's all right. Don't know what else to do. Better than working in a factory. Whichever way you're feeling now, either extreme or just indifference, that's the way it is. So uh, this um, to, uh, uh, way that Lumpur began here, uh, I think it's helpful to to get uh, clear in the in one's mind what we mean by reflection and what we mean by reaction and so using the word react that um at least in the the way it's uh, it's uh, say employed used in dhamma teachings like this it's a kind of automatic reflect uh, uh, sort of um unconscious a uh, way that we relate to uh, things that we like, we chase after them, things that we dislike, we run away from them or oppose them. Uh, and so that there is a, a lack of mindfulness. There's a, like a, an automatic uh, and unconscious, uh, say, a habit that is being uh, that's being employed. When we talk about reflection, or or often using the word response uh, as a contrast to to reaction, then that always uh, implies a quality of mindfulness. There's an awareness of oh, this is the feeling of liking, or this is a feeling of, of worrying, this is the feeling of disliking. There's a spaciousness around that. So um, when we talk about reflection, it implies that quality of uh, say uh, perspective there's a um, a recognition of what's going on there's an attention to the mind state it might be you know so strong that you, you know you can't um say just switch it off like there's something that's really off-putting or shocking or disgusting and you, know, you find yourself physically recoiling or turning away that's um, but also that kind of um say automatic uh, uh say way that the, the the physical system responds to something unpelease or painful like ow you know you get <laughs> you burn your hand it's not like if you're if you're being responsive or reflective hmm it's interesting the hand is burning lots of pain the smoke coming off my fingers hmm curious no it's no the, the hand pulls away from the heat source but um there's a, that mindfulness of uh, of what's going on so that having that uh, clear contrast between uh, reaction and, and reflection, I think, is is good to bear in mind. And so when we use the word react, generally that means there's a, a, a an unconscious or an unmindful um, habit that, that's being followed that we call what's pleasant, good, and uh, and uh, worthy of holding and keeping, staying, and getting close to and uh, what we call bad or, or, or a problem we want to get away from, we want to get rid of it, and we, we tend to take those liking and disliking, um, in owning or fearing and such like as, as absolute qualities. This is beautiful, that is ugly, this is mine, that is, uh, that's something that, that's uh, frightening. 
and we uh, we unconsciously give those qualities of goodness or badness or attractiveness or or off-puttingness uh, we we impute we we give those qualities as absolute values to the things that are perceived if there's reflection if there's a, a responsivity then the mind recognizes oh this liking and disliking fearing and and wanting and such like those are necessarily dependent they're, they're based on the conditioning of, uh, of this living system these particular perceptions so then what Lumpur is emphasizing here um, this and this gave <laughs> the, the title to the whole book you know the way it is um, he uh, emphasizes that uh, here uh, over and over again whether we're inspired rather than getting lost and, and carried away with our inspiration or if we are um, say uninspired we're desperate and getting lost in our desperation uh, our disappointment and uh, lack of faith um, or as he says indifference you know um, <clears throat> you know it's all right being here in Amravati don't don't know what else to do better than working in a factory <laughs> but the uh, that kind of uh, uh, not really caring that if the if we're going to apply the practice if we're going to work with uh, with our experience in a skillful way then there's a recognition oh this is the feeling of being really inspired everything is great i love these people this is a fantastic place what else could i possibly be doing of value with my life well that's what this feeling is in this moment is you're very positive enthusiastic filled with faith or you know i've wasted my life this is of no value this is i'm not getting anywhere hasn't done anything for me again not believing the content of the thoughts but recognizing oh this is what it's like when faith disappears when there's disappointment or uh, no matter how hard i try i never get any kind of rewarding or pleasant beneficial experience from this it, it's it's all a waste of time oh this is the it's all a waste of time feeling that's that's what this is and so there's that recognition of the, this is a mind state this is not a an absolute fact it's not an, an absolute reality it's this pattern in this moment so just notice when you're feeling positive and tremendously energetic or when there's a lack of energy and you're too critical when you're depressed tired or not feeling very well it's hard to arouse the inspired feeling in those circumstances you tend to pick up on what's wrong with things very quickly the way somebody walks across a, a room can really irritate you somebody blows their nose too hard and ugh, that's disgusting but when you're feeling full of inspiration and devotion you don't care about the faults of this or that you're caught up in this feeling of devotion and faith these perceptions are to be reflected on uh, as the way it is now it has to be this way because it can't be any other way at this moment we feel like this we feel tired or invigorated or whatever this is the way it is these are the results of having been born and living our lives and being subject to changing conditions of sensuality uh, and uh, as I've said a few times over, uh, when uh, Longpo uses these kinds of expressions, and uh, there was a question the other day, I think uh, from Roman, um, asking about this, uh, the principles of, sort of just watching or being aware. When when Longpo says things like, um, uh, 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 "This is the way it is now. It has to be this way because it can't be any other way at this moment," that can seem like a very fatalistic uh, uh, perception, or uh, that a uh, sense of everything is predestined, or, or there's uh, there's um, some kind of um, say uh, uh, in a way a sacred quality to this. It's just oh, it's, it's this way. It's got to be this way. It's meant to be this way. Um, but uh, over and over again I like to emphasize that our capacity to act and to make choices in the present moment is also part of the way it is uh, when uh, when you're feeling heat and <laughs> seeing smoke rising from your fingers then the, your capacity to pull your hand away is part of the way it is <laughs> that uh, the the recognition of what's harmful what's beneficial what's noble what's ignoble that's that's part of the way it is and so we are, we're not sort of setting our body our mind our life as apart from the whole living system of the natural world of the natural order um, and so that 
what Lumpur is talking about in this way, it's a very, it's like a very immediate perspective. It's the kind of akaliko dhamma perspective. In this exact moment, it's precisely this way, and then we can watch the mind making a choice and choosing to move towards the good or away from uh, away from the harmful. Um, uh, and uh, and in each of those moments, it's exactly this way in this moment. So it's a. Uh, 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 in a sense, it's based on that quality uh, of timelessness and attunement. So it's not a, a fatalistic, uh, say, perception of like, oh, there's this, there's this pain in my knee. I've been, uh, I, I determined to sit here for three hours, and my knee is on fire. So you know, I, 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 will, I, I should just be with this excruciating, painful feeling. Um, and that, uh, yeah, and if I change my posture, then that's interfering with the way things are, isn't it? it uh, the I would say that your recognition that the, the knee is in serious trouble and, and this uh, intense pain uh, probably indicates there's damage being done. Uh, the the choice to to respond to that by changing the posture is also part of the way things are. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be some kind of intrusion or departure from. Uh, from attunement to, to the way things are, but it can be just the mind uh, being sensitively aware of the limitations of the, the living condition. So I think it's really important to understand that teaching like, you know, this is the way it is, or just, you know, being with open to the way things are, it, it's not a passivity, it's not a, a kind of freezing of one's responsivity, um, but rather uh, it's a, a, a precise moment by moment uh, attunement, and uh, so I, I, I've said that so many times. I think people have probably got the point, but uh, I, I feel it's a a very significant uh, element to, to to bear in mind because it can seem that way. It can it, uh, uh, it can make us uh, say follow a what they call fatalistic attitude. Oh, it's it's uh, this this wrenched knee and my the necessity for me to, to sit on a chair for the next 10 years that's part of the way things are it's like well <laughs> or you could look at it that way but you could also see it's the karmic result of having made a choice to to um uh, not respond to the to the uh the the pain and the sense of, of strain in the body in a in a different way in a way that sort of uh, was more attuned to the the limitations of what the the body was uh, is capable of. So Lumpur goes on to say, then note, really note, what you add to the existing conditions. In all night sittings, you may feel sleepy or tired. Note what you add to that feeling. Note the feeling itself, but maintain a posture, rather than just react to feeling tired from an attempt to annihilate the feeling by following it and sinking into lethargy. When you're convinced that you're so tired, there's really nothing you can do about it, and even pulling your body straight is something that seems totally impossible, hold it up straight for a length of time. Observe and learn how much energy it takes to hold a body up. Also, you might have recognized it doesn't have to be during an all-night sitting when your body is slumping and <laughs> wanting to head uh, uh, head downwards and that uh, we're lacking energy and, uh, ex uh, and the whole system seems to be exhausted. But it's a way, uh, what he's speaking about is a, a way of, of uh, very closely observing what, as he says, what the mind adds to the existing conditions uh, and that that's something that is, uh, say, it takes a lot of work, really, to to be attentive to the judgments that the mind is making. Like, oh, oh, this is awful. I really should do this, or, or um, oh, this is great. I want to, I want to to do uh, to do more of that. Uh, I want to get more of uh, of this experience. Just the 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 continual commentary and uh, say the 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 getting excited and interested and, and carried away or getting worried or um, or irritated that so much of the dukkha that the mind creates is through what it adds on to the present moment experience pleasant painful or neutral and that the more that there's a sense of well in this moment it's this way in this moment it's this way uh, there's a there's a great spaciousness when we're not either uh, creating those kind of commentaries or if they're there, not believing in them, not, not buying into them. 
and just noticing the, the, the raw quality of the experience. Because often painful experiences are not that bad. Experiences of, of fear or, or worry, they're not that bad. Experiences of what we call pleasure, you know, that, uh, a delicious taste or a, uh, a, a comfortable sensation. That uh, you know, the thinking mind might say, "Oh, this is really great. This is so delicious. This is exactly how you know, the, uh, I, I like it." And, or, "Oh, this is really comfy. I really like this." When you bring your attention to to that, or, or uh, say gratifying some kind of desire, that when you uh, again, when you look at it, it's just that uh, that perception, that that sensation in that moment. It's not really that special or that fantastic. That even that, sometimes it's not even that pleasant. So being caught up in gratifying and desire, getting something you really like. Yes, this is great, this is fantastic. If you put the commentary aside and just notice what that feeling is like of getting the thing that you like, it's like, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is not that special, not so, not so wonderful. Or why do I sp spend so much time and make so much effort to, to have this experience? It's, it's, uh, it's not that, not that uh, kind of, delightful or pleasant is actually quite quite stressful or um, particularly for myself i found with with fear i was very uh, very anxious very fearful by by habit and um spent a huge amount of time and energy trying to not be afraid not be anxious and and uh, not be worried and that when uh, following this kind of advice you know during this very retreat the lumpur Sumedha was was leading in back in 88 and uh, and around that time in it was really a, an eye-opener for me that uh, when looking at the experience of, of fear and worry and, and just feeling that as, a, as on the mental side, also on the physical side, one of, uh, one of the things that was really striking was like, wow, I spent so much time and effort trying to get away from this worried feeling. And when you really look at it and notice it and... and, and, and uh, take it uh, as a felt experience it's really not that bad why do i why do i spend so much time and effort trying to not feel this it's, it's not even as bad as a headache or a stone in the shoe or <laughs> it's just it's really not that uncomfortable and i kind of felt ripped off how many years have i spent trying to not feel this and what have i done how much before i was a monk how much did i drink <laughs> You know, how much alcohol did I consume to not be feeling this? When, when you actually experience that worry as a physical sense or as a mental formation, it's like, what's the big problem? <laughs> why, why was this so awful? Why was this so unbearable? And, uh, but yeah, it, the reason why was because the, the mental side kind of adding a whole uh, that aspect to it and, and getting lost in the content of the worries. But when you let go of the content and you just feel and know that the process of worrying mentally and physically it was astonishing like wow it's really it's really not that much and uh, and so that uh, that brings a, a, a clarity and a simplicity and um, with particularly with emotional reactions of loving something caught in, uh, being caught up in a desire uh, a desire for something that's attractive or beautiful in terms of a person or in terms of foods or sounds or colors and, and uh, ideas that when when that's being gratified again you just say what <laughs> well in itself in, in that actual sensory experience why is this so special why do i put so much effort into just wanting this particular taste or this particular texture or, or getting close to that particular form Big deal, <laughs> and not not creating negativity, but just the sense of my goodness, what was what was all the fuss about? Why was I what, spending so much time and energy just to have this particular taste or that particular um, uh, texture? Uh, and and so there's a, a a simplicity, a spaciousness around the sensory world uh, that we don't experience when the mind is just following its habits and getting lost in in its. Uh, Say conditioning and the, the the perceptions that we're we've uh, become accustomed to liking and disliking and, and and fearing and so forth. So, any questions, thoughts, perceptions? Okay, carry on. 
How much energy does it take to stop the thinking process? Have you ever noticed that? Just can't stop thinking. The mind goes on and on. Can't stop. What can I do? I don't know how to stop thinking. It just keeps going. I can't stop it. I know about this because I've always had a problem with a mind that just seemed to be endlessly thinking about something. And the desire to stop thinking and the effort to get rid of it um, create the conditions for more thinking. It takes effort to do this, not just thinking about doing it. I remember an Australian Abhidhamma fanatic once came to Wat Papong. This man had a mission. When Westerners get into Abhidhamma, they become like born-again Christians. But he didn't know how to meditate. He didn't believe that meditation worked. And he figured it all out with his Abhidhamma concepts. He felt that you couldn't stop thinking. He said, you're always thinking and you can't stop thinking. I said, but you can stop thinking. And he said, no, you can't. And I said, I've just stopped thinking. And he said, no, you can't. <laughs> sorry. And then, sorry. Uh, and then he said, no, you haven't. It was pointless to go on talking to someone like that. You have to be alert to know when you're not thinking. So you, you take an actual thought like, I can't stop thinking, and you deliberately think it. This is what I did, because I was a habitual, obsessive thinker. So, if you are averse to thinking, instead of trying to stop, go to the other extreme and deliberately think something. And watch yourself deliberately thinking, so that it's not just a wandering thought process in which your mind goes around and around in circles. Use your wisdom faculty. Deliberately think something, some thought that is completely neutral and uninteresting, like, I am a human being. Deliberately think it, but observe the space before your thinking, and then deliberately say, I am a human being. Then note the end of the thought, the moment when you stop thinking. Pay attention to the moments before and after the thought, rather than to the thought itself. Just hold attention on where there is no thought. Investigate the space around the thought, the space where the thought comes and goes, rather than thinking. Then you'll be aware of an empty mind, where there's just awareness but no thought. That may last for just a second because you start grasping, so you just have to keep being more aware by thinking something again. With practice, you can use even very unpleasant thoughts. For example, you might have strong emotional feelings of, I'm no good, I'm worthless, and they can be an obsession. In some people's minds, they can become a background to their lives. So you try thinking, I shouldn't think that. Venerable Sumedho says, I'm good, but I know I'm no good. However, if you take that obsession and use it as a conscious thought, I am no good, you start seeing the space around it and, it, and it no longer sounds so absolute. When it becomes obsessive, it sounds absolute, infallible, the honest truth, the real truth. This is what I really am. I'm no good. But when you take it out of the context of obsession and think it deliberately, intentionally, you see it objectively. That sense of me and mine is just a habit of the mind. It's not the truth. If you really take the I, I am, and look at it objectively, the feeling created by that I am, and I am this way, or I should be, should not be, is very different from when you're just reacting. So this is a very significant practice, and I was extremely grateful for Lumpur teaching this in those those years. Again, having a, a mind that likes to chatter away by by habit, and um, uh, uh, so this is a a, a, a method I, I really recommend. Uh, as he says, it's quite different if you just uh, relate to thought as when the mind is is chattering away, and you want to just make it shut up, um, and then when the, it does go quiet, then you sort of grasp hold of that quietness and you fear the thinking coming back in, then it's a sort of uh, uh, a, 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 a stop-go compulsive um, experience. But uh, instead of, of trying to push thought away and then re regretting when it's overtaken the mind, then to, to instead 
uh, turn towards it and to to deliberately learn how to perceive thought as a, a mental object. Well, we tend to, to relate to, to thought as a very different uh, sensory experience than sight, sound, smell, taste or touch. And uh, we put it in a different category. But in, in Buddhist psychology, thinking is just another sense object. You know, the eye sees, perceives light, the ears perceive sound, and the mind perceives thought. It's just, just another sense object. It doesn't have like, a sacred position as it tends to do in, the, in our Western uh, appreciation or understanding of things. And so this way of, of like learning to recognize thought simply as a sense object, you can, using this kind of a, of a, a neutral statement, so that you're wanting to, to be able to know thought without getting lost in it. You take something very bland and non-personal, like I am a human being, or I often uh, would uh, take something like today is Thursday, or this month is March. You know, it's like there's no emotional loading. It's not personal. It's not anything about you as an individual or, or um, anything that's very questionable. It's not really up for a sort of debate or discussion. It's a, it's a very, very simple uh, statement, and as he says, you you make it as you, you make it a, a deliberate exercise. That, uh, try to make, to focus the attention as as fully as possible. Notice the space before the thought forms, and then just deliberately think that sentence: "I am a human being," or "Today is Thursday," or "This, this month is March." And then uh, noticing that, that shape, just like looking at the microphone and seeing the, you know, the round shape of the microphone and the straight shape of the bar, you know, and the, the color of the blackness of the, of the, um, uh, of the microphone against the, the pale gray of the tiles. Okay, there's a form, there's a color, there's, there's uh, uh, these particular combination of, of features. So in exactly the same way, there's a word and there's silence and there's a, a word today is Thursday, and then silence after that. So there's no big difference, no huge um, contrast between a thought form uh, in the in speech or in the mental world, uh, as you know, the, in terms of uh, visual uh, visual forms, visible forms to to the eye, or the sound of a word. Silence, word, silence. <laughs> And that the, there's a, a space and then a form and then a, and then a space. So then uh, by using a bland statement like I'm a human being or today is Thursday and so on, then you begin to see how there can be a, a thought, but there's still spaciousness around that. It's like the, the, the microphone and the, the bar don't fill the whole space of the temple here. Similarly, the thought today is Thursday is just there within the space of the mind. It's not absolutely all and everything. If you absorb into the content of the, the thought and... Um, and when it's more emotionally charged, like you know, I'm no good, or I'm worthless, or I am special, um, then the when it's got something more personal to it, or there's an emotional um, quality that's in it, then the attention more gets drawn to the content of the the thought. But um, as Lumpur suggests here, uh, with practice, then even those emotionally loaded or much more personal. Uh, uh, thoughts where the attention gets lost in the content, it can still maintain a just a clear awareness of the process of a thought form of "I'm no good" or "I am special" or "I am ordinary." <laughs> I'm completely average. Uh, the the mind can still perceive those as as uh, as objects arising, taking shape, and dissolving in space. And so that what you're doing is you're learning to to be aware of thought as a, a process without getting lost in, in the content of it and then with that sense of of uh, say of knowing how uh, thought uh, you know, thinking arises takes shape takes shape and dissolves then there's a, a much greater uh, capacity to be mindful of it to not get lost in, in the uh, in the content and then uh, you can use this kind of practice in, in many and various ways. And so just looking into the, uh, the as he said in that last little part about the, the I am feeling, and to recognize this, even if you take a thought like I am, uh, or, or, or your name, 
into just repeating your, your name or the I am or just I. <laughs> and then uh, looking at that and knowing that simply a, as a thought form. And also the, um, uh, you can use it as a, a direct support for developing the insight, into, particularly into not-self. Because uh, when uh, something like I or I am or our name, there's so much attachment, there's so much so conditioning around that uh, that you know, I, I am, this is me, this I'm a person, this is what I am, this is my nature, um, that uh, when we start to see those uh, literally just as thought forms and patterns of conditioning, then it opens up the heart to that, the insight of... of uh, what, you know, what's this? What is this that the uh, the word "I" is referring to? That when when we think of our name, what is the the referent? What what is this that the name is referring to? Oh, and so it can be a, a very direct trigger, a kind of um, doorway into the insight into not self. That uh, it, the mind recognizes that your name is just a convention. It's just a a, a way of labeling a particular. Uh, pattern of of experience and uh, what we call a person. Similarly, our, our name, all the, all the the memories and the ideas and the feelings and so on, the, the conditioning around the family and our history that goes along with the name. Similarly, just that uh, that quality of perspective and seeing the the empty nature of those perceptions that that can be triggered, that can be catalyzed by by looking at that rather than just. Uh, you know, hearing our name or thinking I am and just taking that as a, a solid, absolute, uh, permanent reality, this kind of deliberate thinking, conscious exploration using reflective thought can be a very, very helpful way to, to know, directly to awaken to the empty nature of those perceptions. Any questions, thoughts? Anybody there? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, about that is, it's, to me, if I try this, it would be a lot of um, thinking, actually. Oh, it, it would feel like that, like a normal thinking, in a way. Like, or perhaps, should it be done when the mind is more calm? Mm -hmm. Uh, after some, uh, maybe an up an hour or whatever. Because if I really, it's just uh, like now, I I would be thinking about the silence or it wouldn't be very deep in a way. Um, yes. Yeah. Or it would still feel conceptual, even the perception of silence or the, uh, the yeah, the general idea would, would be kind of conceptual, I don't know. Yeah, it, it works most effectively as a practice if there's a basis of calm. So you start off with, with establishing as much inner quietness as possible. So that it's, it's like with, with the temple, you know, you, 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 uh, you pick up all the cushions, you, you sweep the floor and then you put the cushions out, you make a clear open space and uh, have things as, as tidy, as clear and as, and as open as possible and then in that inner quietness and inner spaciousness that so uh, if it's just a, another um another little word you know like you just jamming today is thursday in the midst of a whole kind of crowd of people and activity in the and the chaos it doesn't really have a, an effect there's no space around it so to to bring the mind to as much quietness and steadiness and stillness as possible and then also relaxation of the body using the physical relaxation, physical ease, that's very, very helpful because the, 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 the relaxation, the stability um, uh, uh, of, the, of the body strongly supports uh, the relaxation and, and stability of the, of the mind as well. So that uh, if, we, if we spend a, 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 at the beginning of a, a meditation period spending a good amount of time establishing the posture really relaxing as fully and completely as possible, then you're focusing the attention and the body and the mind is creating a, 
uh, a basis of calm and spaciousness, quietness, to the extent possible. And then, you say, deliberately picking up an exercise like this. And, and then, it, if the mind does tend to be chattery and busy, then it's really important to start with a, as bland a statement as you can. Like, today is... Thursday. I mean, maybe the, if the day of the week is something got an, an emotional charge, you know, choose something else. Thursday, yes, you yeah. <laughs> know, it's my day off the washing up, you know. But uh, then just choose something else so that you're you're just using a very very simple phrase. Really, just developing that skill of this is another perceptual uh, perceptual object. That's all, and then. As Lung Po is describing in this, noticing the space before, and then there's the form of the thought, and then there's the space after. And then as that's developed, and there's more skill uh, around that, then you can notice how even when the form of the, the word is there, or the, 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 the few words are there, you still have a sense of the space around them. Like, just like, you know, you can... Uh, uh, you can see a visual object. You can see the the microphone and the and the the bar, and then there's the, the rest of the space of the temple around that, and the people, and uh, so on. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, as you're thinking the words, you know, today is Thursday. That doesn't fill the whole attention. You can, there's a sense of okay, there's those uh, those thoughts, but the the basic spaciousness of the mind is not interrupted by that. And so then as that's developed, and in particular in supporting vipassana meditation and being mindful and aware of thought in uh, arising and passing away in vipassana, then the, a flow of thought or a memory or an idea can take shape, but it, there's a sense of perspective on that. Yeah, that thought is there, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't occlude, it doesn't mask the, the space of the mind. The spaciousness of, of the mind is is uninterrupted by the presence of that thought and then and then as he's describing again things that are more emotionally charged more personal things that you're excited by things that you're irritated by things that you're you've got doubts about you're worried about then the, the you're more and more able to to feel and to know those in exactly the same way yes they're there they have a particular tone like with food it's like yes this is a a particular flavor and it's like the mind uh, then oh this is a taste i really don't like okay this is a taste i really like okay and it, the taste doesn't disappear but in, in a mysterious way that when you work with the mind like this and you, you train it not to add anything to those perceptions you're able to kind of enjoy or to be uh, to be more um really appreciative of what's there you, you don't have to kind of grab hold of the things you like or get away from the things you dislike. It's just, oh, it's just this. And so, in a way, it makes it even more enjoyable because <laughs> you're not getting uh, sort of uh, lost in the commentary about it. But I do recommend that the often with meditation, because it seems to be such a mental, uh, an area of mental activity, and like I was saying a couple of days ago about the body, we can, if the body isn't hurting, we can kind of forget that it's having an influence. And so it's another, uh, really another of Lumpur Sumedho's teachings that, uh, that I found extremely helpful over the years. Uh, he would emphasize to really put attention on the posture and, and settle into the, the, the posture and recognize the, the importance of balancing energy and relaxation in the posture before you get onto the mental realm. And it's kind of the, the more active and eager the mind is to get going on the practice. <laughs> it's, okay, all very well. Now what's the body doing? Yeah, how does it feel? Because we can work in a way very hard to try and quiet the mind and not realize that the body is sort of <laughs> is full of agitation. It, it's, it's creating agitated um, reactions in the mental world. And if the body is settled and relaxed and balanced, really at ease, then it, is, it strongly supports that quality of ease in the mental world as well. Gaspar, did you have a question you were going to ask? Thank you. Yes, I did. Um, 
partly motivated by the silence. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay, I do have some questions, so maybe I can just ask this one. Uh, but since I have the microphone, I might as, as well uh, sort of proceed. So I was, I was just um, sort of playing around with this idea of how would it be to grow up in an environment where one would sort of lack certain concepts, like for example, an infant is growing in a, in a culture where they don't have um, reference to themselves or, or a word for an eye or a word for uh, to have. Um, and then I was just thinking, it seems to be there is a internal knowing uh, which exists independently of the actual tokens of meaning. So words are sort of uh, merely just sort of abstractions of, of this inner knowing. And I guess I'm wondering, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. Is there an innate sense of sort of self that is uh, independent of, um, of the ab abstraction? Or is it the case that as we grow up, we are sort of reinforced and fed back uh, through these sort of tokens of meaning, oh, it's you, you have, you own, etc. I don't know if this was clear enough, but <laughs> I trust that you at least understand a part of it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, my understanding and my experience is that we're, we're very heavily influenced by our conditioning as we grow up, you know, as human beings or in the, the animal world, by our, the, the family uh, that we grow up in, the, the group that we're a part of, whether we have a family or we don't have a family, the language that we use, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are uh, human communities where they just, they don't have pronouns like we, we have in European languages, like, like she, he, they, we, they, they, for, they, they have verbs of doing, um, but the, the pronouns don't really function. There aren't really pronouns in the same kind of way. There's like, there's, there's, there's talking, or, uh, but there, you don't say, I, you know, I am talking, or, or you know, I, you know, I am talking to you, uh, sort of, and the mind doesn't form those kind of fixed separate entities. Other languages, they don't have nouns. So there isn't there isn't person. There's personing, or there isn't book. There's booking. So you just have adverbs and uh, and verbs. You don't really have things. You know, I often talk about some you know some of these languages like uh, Hopi and Navajo and uh, this uh, particular tribe uh, tribal group in the, in South America, the Piraha, and they have radically different concepts of of, of time. You. You, and, and personhood, like you can't talk about a person who's not present. Like if Gaspar walks out of the temple, there's no way of talking about Gaspar because he's not here. You know, that, uh, that, you know, that, I mean, that, that's a sweeping statement, but that kind of thing that, where I was thinking, well, Gaspar, yeah, Gaspar is here today, you know, and, and uh, or that you can't talk about events in the past that you weren't a personal witness of. Or like the, the, in the language of the Piraha, Piraha, which is I find really extraordinary, they they have no fixed words for color. They they have no concept of number. They they're very functional as a community. They commu they have their, their verb forms. They like tens of thousands of verb forms and such like. And they very they work very comfortably and easily together with each other. But the whole way that they frame their lives and they consider you know who and what they are. It's just formed very, very, very differently, and reflected uh, in their language. And the the the, um, the book that I, I read about this is called uh, "Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes." Uh, and the uh, the fellow who was uh, who wrote it was an American missionary. He really had to learn how to think like the tr people of the tribe before he could learn their language, because the language just you couldn't function in terms of, you know, pronouns, verbs, subject, object. <laughs> like, it, was just, it was not their world. 
So uh, I feel it's, it's very much the case that what we think of as uh, as self uh, and uh, the way we think of I and you and he and she and we and so on, these are uh, the particular patterns of them are formed very heavily out of our our familiar relationships. Also, people who have different mental abilities that um, they uh, sometimes are just because of uh, of the the brain structure or particular conditioning from inf from infancy, they can't form a, a sense of self. They feel they feel pleasure, they feel pain, but the word I doesn't have a, or I has no meaning. Or like a little baby, you know, who's like six months old, they have no language in, in, in many ways, but they feel pain, they feel pleasure, they know um, what's familiar, what's unfamiliar, they know smells, and they haven't got a word for it, <laughs> but they, they know it, they, their life is guided by those things. So uh, uh, I think it, one of the things with, with Dhamma practice is that it's, it's kind of, it, hope, <laughs> if, if, it's, if it's working, it's extremely humbling. <laughs> Because as we grow up into adulthood, and we, we say maybe we encounter, encounter Dhamma in our adulthood, we come into it thinking, yeah, I know what the world is. I know who I am, and I know... Uh, and we don't realize that this world and the way that it's formed and this person is heavily conditioned and structured around our background, our family, our, our language, our education. And so we think that, that what we what we experience is the world, <laughs> and that as the Dhamma practice is developed, there's more and more of that humbling experience. Of, oh no, no, this is just one very heavily conditioned version that my mind calls the world. This is really just this being's putting together of a version of the world and the the experiencer, and that that I feel is an essential part of the development of insight is that humility, recognizing that just because my mind sees it this way, it doesn't make it true or real or the, the, the one genuine version. It's just one perspective on, on experience. Uh, one, 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 say, a way of understanding uh, reality. You know, and for many, uh, many human communities, you know, the eye, and even just like living in Northeast Thailand, in the, the sort of rural uh, village life of northeast Thailand, that their relationship to the individual and individual excellence you know, is very, very different from what we have in the West. So, um, I mean, I couldn't understand the language particularly well, but uh, talking with the people there and you know, one or two of the monks, particularly Ajahn Pabakro, who was the abbot there, had really, really good command of the local dialect and so he was he really understood that the the local value system uh, uh, very directly and acutely from connecting with the local villagers and uh, so the for the for them for the as a community the village is the most important thing then comes your family then comes you as a person so whether you are particularly good at something like you're particularly um, say strong, or you're you're good with with uh, sewing, or with with numbers, or you're you, know, you have uh, so I can say if you're if you're proud of that, or you think that you're somebody special because you're a really good sewer, or you're really good at, at doing your mathematics, then if you if you if you sort of feel like you stand out, then people generally think of you as a bit of an idiot, and that the. the but if you're, uh, and if you're someone who's selfish or puts himself first, even if you, you, know, you might come from a, a, a sort of very reputable family in the village or you have quite a lot of money, people think, oh, poor bloke, you know, poor guy. Yeah, this man is, a, is, is impoverished because he thinks he's special. <laughs> and somebody who is, is always looking out, always ready to volunteer to help with the rice planting or fixing somebody's roof or is kind of ready to lend a hand with, with, with the village life and is, has a strong community conscious, consciousness, you know, whether they are particularly wealthy or strong or good looking, just, it doesn't matter at all because there will be someone who's, who's loved and respected because they, they've got a, a, a community sense. And so that was really interesting. Uh, and it's not something that's forced. It's really that they, they grow up with that. They learn that, that from from, child, from early childhood, that the uh, and that putting your family, thinking your family is more important than the other families of the village. Again, people think, oh, poor, you know, 
<laughs> poor, poor, poor fools, you know. Why do they think they're so special, poor things? And that, it, not in a condescending way, but it just like in a, as if there was some kind of illness, you know, that, oh, you know, they've got a bad infection. <laughs> How unfortunate. Um, and so that was, as I encountered that over the first few months of living there back in the late 70s, it was like, wow, that's a really different way of, of operating than growing up in the West where, you know, you being the sort of the top of the class or getting a, a, a first class degree or winning uh, winning the race or... or um, or being the best dancer or whatever you think, oh you know that that's something that's praised or revered or uh, that you get um that kind of uh, points <laughs> so social social strokes for it's like it, it's, it was completely different um and uh, so that was a um something that you can see is coming right from the earliest conditioning and and so that they're their world, what is beautiful, what's what's ugly, what's inspiring, what's depressing, is 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 very very different. the The awareness that knows it, I would say, is exactly the same. Just like the 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 oxygen that we breathe is exactly the same, or the the, the sunlight that falls on our skin is the same, or the force of gravity on our bodies is is a non personal natural quality. So, at its very root, the awareness that that knows these different patterns of conditioning uh, is the same. I would say. But the the content uh, and the processes of conditioning uh, is radically different. So I like it's to say, uh, I mean, again, going back to the piraha. Uh, I remember, you know, you, if you if you function in the, you know, in the general sort of academic world, and you think in terms of of knowledge and, and science and information and such like, you, you know, people would say that the the ultimate language of the universe is mathematics. For the piraha. They don't use numbers. Numbers have no meaning. So they, you know, the the the, 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 the this fellow was um, the, this missionary was trying to teach them, he, and he said how about uh, and some of them were interested. I think we we think this might be useful. So we, we're really going to try hard on this. And he would explain, okay, this is you know one. You have like sort of three or four sticks, and he'd say, okay, this is one stick. This is two sticks. You know, this is three sticks. And they say, well. Well, that one's got more knobs on it than that one. <laughs> that one's longer than that one. <laughs> they can see, oh, they can obviously see the differences, but he'd say, "No, well, there's two. and they say, "Yeah, that one's shorter than that one." <laughs> and the, and and if you really reflect on it, when you say, "You know, what what is one? What is two? It's like, well, two what? You know, two two planets. Oh, it's that idea of oneness or twoness or threeness. Oh, it's something that the thinking mind is adding on to, you can say, two objects, a book and a clock. Well, okay, there's two, but one's a book, one's a clock. There's just one one way of, of designating some kind of quality, but it doesn't have any substance. There's no thing really there. And so that... Uh, I, I feel, in terms of developing insight, that it's really good to to take those the, those kind of things in and realize, oh, sanya anicca. <laughs> Perceptions are uh, imperfect. They are they are uncertain. They are they're not absolute. Uh, and things like in number, time, identity, these are all. Uh, things that are given solidity by the attitude of the mind and and the more that the inside is developed is recognized there isn't really anything there <laughs> the thingness uh, is, uh, is, a, is a, a function of the attitude of mind that uh, yeah we have there are these perceptions and communications and real changes can be brought about by those perceptions and and the way the mind it, it works but so much of it is recognizing the fundamentally empty nature of every perception and things that we take to be true and solid and real, like I, time, number, place, uh, individuality. These are impressions. They're seemings. There's no thing absolutely there. And that the, the, the development of insight is is a, a, a stepping down from those conceits of you know I understand I know I've this is the world 
this is beautiful, that's ugly, this is right, that, that's wrong, this is mine, that's yours. And it, it recognizes, well, those only can be convenient fictions. They only can be uh, subjective impressions. There's no absolute thing there. So the mind stops giving it an absolute solidity and then it is able to see things more accurately in the, in their true light. And that, just as I was saying, the more that we sort of let go of that delicious taste and stop getting drunk on it, we actually can, in a way, enjoy the taste more. <laughs> Because the mind isn't creating anything around it. So that seeing the empty nature of perceptions and you know, the five khandhas, it, it, in a mysterious way, it enables the heart to be more fully and completely attuned to the way things are by having let, letting, let go of the way things are. And that's really, the I think, the, the, the core of Buddhist practice is around that, that the Buddha is the embodiment of having completely let go of the world his whole nature, his mind, his heart is totally attuned to the world and to the, the living beings around. So maybe just to read a little bit more. In contemplating the Four Noble Truths, you have the truth of suffering, its arising, its cessation, and then the path. You can't know the path and the way out of suffering until you are aware of where everything ceases, in the mind itself. The mind is still vital and alert, even when there's no thought in it, but if you don't notice that, you believe that you're always thinking. That's the way it seems. You only conceive of yourself when you're thinking, because you're identified with memory and the sense of I am or I am not. That yourself, quote unquote, is very much conditioned programmed perception in the mind. As long as you believe in that perception and never question it, you'll always believe that you are an obsessive thinker and that you shouldn't be this way, or you shouldn't feel that way, you shouldn't worry, but you do, and you're a hopeless case. So it goes on from one thing to another. So I am, quote unquote, is just a perception, really. It arises in the mind and it ceases in the mind. When it ceases, note that cessation of thought. Make that cessation, that empty mind, a sign rather than just creating more things in the emptiness. You can get refined states of consciousness by fixing on refined objects, as in samatha meditation practices that emphasize calming the mind. But with the contemplation of the noble truths, you're using the wisdom faculty to note where everything ceases. And yet when the, em and yet when the mind is empty, the senses are still all right. It's not like being in a trance, totally oblivious to everything. Your mind is open, empty, or you might call it whole, complete, bright. Then you can take anything, like a fearful thought. You can take it, deliberately think it, and see it as just another condition of the mind rather than a psychological problem. It arises, it ceases. There's nothing in it, nothing in any thought, it's just a movement in the mind, and therefore it's not a person. You make it personal by attaching to it, believing it. And I'm such a hopeless case. I know I can never be enlightened after all the things I've done, the stupid things. I'm so selfish, and I've made so many mistakes. I know there's no hope for me. All that arises and ceases in the mind. So I think it's a, a very good... Um, the set of reflections to, to close on for today that uh, is challenging. You have, uh, I, it's, uh, I would not underestimate the kind of quickness. <laughs> You've got to be sort of quick on your feet mentally to, to, to so in a sense, keep track of those, those creations and judgments and the way that self-view and the, uh, I am, I'm this, I'm not that, uh, how easily and quickly that all takes shape. But... The, the more that there can be that or quickness or alertness, that that uh, watchfulness, then um, then we find there's uh, there's great spaciousness and also as um, as Dumpo puts it here, your mind is open, empty, or you might call it whole, complete, bright. And so Lumpur Cha used the same kind of expression. You know, he would say, uh, we call it emptiness, but uh, we say the mind is empty, but actually that means it's full of wisdom. So even words like empty uh, are conditional. They're just 
ways of, of speaking. So that the empty mind is empty of thingness. You know, the the mind is not creating solid thoughts and and people and objects, but uh, it's it's full. It's full of wisdom. It's it's full of that light of of knowing, uh, and that uh, the that's. Uh, seeing of how these things happen the, the the mind makes a judgment this is great this is beautiful and then gets lost in it and say okay the mind is getting caught then to to let go and to see oh this is just the mind attaching to uh, yeah a, a pleasant uh, inspired feeling or when there's criticism or, or you know self self aversion and such like to recognize oh here's uh, the mind is just um, attaching to that believing in it and that just over and over and over and over again with endless amounts of patience just uh, seeing how the, these creations and habits these judgments of mind they're, they're nothing solid there's nothing absolute there that, and when they're they're not given that solidity by the attitude by the habit then there's what remains is spaciousness peacefulness and clarity so let's leave it there for today <laughs>